Hello, good morning. This is um, the second lecture week four, corresponding to Wednesday, April the 22nd. We're going to continue in this class seeing the five-parted families um, with special emphasis on the economically very important mint family, the family Lamiaceae. Let me start then uh, with um, the slides in the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll share screen. And last week we saw very quickly that the main five parted families in the California wild flora were the um, Solanaceae, the tomato family or the nightshade family, then the um, um, hydrophilaceae, the water leaf family, the boraginaceae, the borage family. And all these three families have uh, corollas that are uh, actinomorphic, that are uh, radiate. They have many planes of symmetry. Within uh, these uh, three families, we saw the solanaceae, in which I sort of uh, delved a little bit because it's economically immensely important family. It's one of the, of the families actually that feed the world, uh, especially because of the potato. Um, and now we're going to see the other two. The hydrophilaceae and the boraginaceae both have a uh, helicoid sign. Both have an inflorescence in the form of a helicoid sign. The main difference between the hydrophilaceae and the boraginaceae is that the former, the hydrophilaceae, have uh, sticky hairs in the surface of the plant. And the helicoid sign is not as marked, as intense as in the boraginaceae. Both are very common in the California wild flora. And going into more detail, the hydrophilaceae, the fruit of the hydrophilaceae is a capsule, a dry capsule with many seeds. Well, as we'll see in a second, the fruit and the boraginaceae is, a, uh, is composed of four nutlets. Uh, the general uh, look of the hydrophilaceae is illustrated here by a drawing of Nemophila menciesi, ba baby blue eyes, which is very common in the, in the California um, flower blooms in spring when we do get a flower bloom. This year has not been a year of flower blooms and anyway we're not going to the field um, and you can see the superior ovary uh, with uh, many ovules that eventually will lead a capsule you can see the helicoid sign here turning like a scorpion tail uh, into a spiral in one direction and you can see the glandular hairs uh, you have here another illustration of um, uh, Facilia minor, another very common plant in the California wild flora, with cross-cutting um, examples of the uh, of the ovary and the um, parite. Sorry, the axillar axile placentation it has the ovaries formed by two carpels, as you can see here. Some California plants that are important. One is Eriodicton trichocalyx, which we would have seen in the Swarthout Canyon. Uh, you can see the very, this one doesn't have so much watery hairs, but uh, the leaves are um, sticky with the resin. The leaves are resinous, uh, which is a variant of the watery structure. You can see with some imagination the little scorpioid cymes here. Uh, Eriodicton trichocalyx, which is common in chaparral, in California chaparral, was uh, was used very, very intensely by different native groups in California, by the ancestral uh, First Nations of uh, California as a medicinal plant. It's boiled and uh, the, um, the tea that is obtained from boiling is used for a number of, of uh, medicinal purposes, it's supposed to cure a number of diseases, especially to control fever in people that have an, an infection or now a uh, viral, it's, it's relevant now, as a matter of fact, because of a high fever, high fever produced by 
by the COVID-19 virus, it's supposed to control bouts of very high fever and has been traditionally for hundreds or thousands of years by the ancestral Californian native groups. Uh, hence the name, by the way, the common name even in English to this day is Yerba Santa, holy herb in, in Spanish. Uh, Eucrypta chrysanthemifolia uh, grows mostly in forests and in shaded areas, very common in our botanical gardens. Uh, the wild Canterbury bells uh, in Oakland, we would have seen it in the Santa Rosa Plateau. And of course, the Mophila menciesi, the baby blue eyes, uh, that here you have a beautiful photo of Antelope Valley in uh, the big flower bloom of year 2003. Um, it was an, an incredible bloom that, that year, and you can see here the California uh, poppy in orange and uh, Nemophila menciesi, the baby blue eyes, all over uh, the flower bloom. By the way, here in yellow, what you see is the fiddle neck, the, the common fiddle neck. You see in a second, it's in the Boraginaceae. So we go to the Boraginaceae. It's very similar, the physiognomy to the um, Hydrophilaceae. You will recognize it in the field by especially the fiddle head coils. And the hairs in the Boraginaceae are prickly. They are not sticky. Um, and um, this is uh, an illustration of the helicoid sign. The helicoid sign is very marked in the borages. Um, and this is the Mophila menciesi, uh, known as a fiddle neck herb, or just simply as fiddle neck. Uh, you can see how marked it is, uh, the coiling. And you can see that the hairs are not glandular, but, uh, but really they're bristly. They're like bristles. They can be somewhat uh, urticant and prickly in some plants. And you can see here, uh, the ovary is composed by, uh, actually it's composed by two carpels, like the hydrophilaceae, but it has two ovules in each carpel. So it gives, uh, at the end it produces four nutlets. One carpel will produce two nutlets, the other carpel will produce two nutlets. And the um, style is basiform, the, the style is inserted in between the four carpels um, and it reaches uh, the base of the ovary. It has a number of uh, important medicinal herbs in Europe, especially Borago officinalis, the borage that was uh, cured. It was uh, used to make a tincture uh, with alcohol and used to disinfect uh, wounds and comfrey with uh, similar use. Very important uh, um, medicinal uses in Europe, not so much in the Americas. Uh, some common California plants, perhaps the most common in the California wildflowers uh, set is Amsinchia menciesi, the one I illustrated at the beginning. You can see here the fill neck and uh, you can see the flowers in the helicoid sign. Another common plant is uh, Plagiobotrys, the genus. Uh, it's known as a popcorn flower because when you see them in the field, it looks with some imagination like uh, popcorn has been thrown onto the field, white flowers with uh, little yellow dots in the middle, plagiobotrys. There are myriad species of plagiobotrys, very difficult to identify in, in the field. This one is Californicus, but don't even uh, attempt to identify a plagiobotrys on the field. They're fairly difficult to identify. Uh, and very related to uh, plagiobotrys, the cryptanthas are just smaller, very similar white flowers, helicoid cymes. There's a little yellow mark in the central of the corolla where the sexual parts are. Um, the cryptanthas are all over. You can see it here again, another photo in Antelope Valley. Look at the dense formation of cryptanthas uh, here in the, in the center. Very, very common in California flowering. Now, we're gonna go now to the other two families, the mint family, the Lamiaceae, and the snapdragon family, the Scrofulariaceae. The mint family is very, very easy to identify in the field uh, because it has square stems. If you roll the stems in between your fingers, you will see that they're square. Uh, the leaves are 
always opposite. In all the family, the leaves are always, always opposite. And invariably, all members of a family have a strong fragrance. Uh, they have a substance called um, essential oils. We'll talk about them in a second. Uh, but if you crush the leaves, it will smell nice. Uh, they have a very nice smell. And then, of course, if you look at the flowers, they have tulip flowers. Of, like the previous family we saw, like uh, the Boraginaceae, they have four lobed ovaries with four nutlets. Uh, you can see here again an illustration. Normally, the flowers in the mint family, this is not an absolute rule, but it's fairly frequent. Uh, they normally have uh, inflorescences in, in, uh, in dense um, spikes. They form spikes along the stem. In a node in the stem, they may form a dense spike, and then the stem keeps growing, and it might form another dense spike, and so on and so forth. The flower has three fused petals below, two fused petals above. The, the low, this is known as the lower lip, this is known as the upper lip, and both lips fused uh, into a tubular corolla. Uh, the, um, it has, like the Boraginaceae, it has two carpels. Each carpel is in itself divided into, has two ovules that eventually uh, make uh, four nutlets, and the style is forked into two stigmas, one stigma for each carpel. Uh, you can see here another, a much better illustration than mine, as a matter of fact, with a zygomorphic flower. And, and you can see actually the structure of the zygomorphic flower. It's a perfect landing strip for insects. Insects coming in will normally rest on the lower lip and force the upper lip to sort of bend down and, and touch the insect with uh, anthers full of pollen and uh, with the um, uh, style and the stigmas uh, that are uh, receptive to pollen brought from other plants. Uh, you can see the flowers very frequently in clusters. Uh, here in clusters forming a raceme of clusters, or here the clusters repeating themselves in spikes uh, all along the stem. Important plants. Uh, this is another family like the Solanaceae, of the five-parted families, this is the one with a lot of important plants. Um, it has the mint uh, in all its variants. There are like five or six species of mint uh, that, uh, that are used, the peppermint, for example, or the spearmint. Uh, they're used uh, for culinary purposes, and the essential oils are extracted and, and uh, used in all sorts of... Uh, they're normally dissolved in alcohol and used both in toiletry and in giving uh, taste, um, flavor to food. Sage, oregano, basil, thyme. And I could go on and on and on. If you look at your herb uh, cupboard in the kitchen, almost all the plants you will find there belong to the family Lamiaceae. They have a huge importance as culinary herbs and also as uh, aromatic plants uh, from which uh, uh, essential oils can be extracted to make toiletries. For example, the English lavender. Uh, lavandula, the, the genus of lavender, has a number of species that are commercially cultivated. The English lavender, Lavandula officinalis, um, which is, has been introduced to California from Europe, it's a European plant, is immensely important uh, for all sorts of, uh, to make soap, perfumes, deodorants, um, and all sorts of toiletries. Now, the Darwin in the kitchen section. Uh, the Lamiaceae have been known for a long time that they produce a substance that can be extracted and, and it's known in, in the general jargon as an essential oils. Uh, the different Lamiaceae you can extract by distillation or by dissolving in alcohol the essential oils and they will smell like the plant. The essential oils of mint smell like mint. The essential oils of um, lavender smell like lavender. Really, they're not oils at all as, as uh, in the 
a group of lipids in the in the uh, biochemistry uh, group of, of compounds. They, they are a series of volatile molecules called terpenes. And terpenes are chains of uh, a molecule that you see here, which is a molecule of isoprene, which is formed by five carbons. And isoprenes can combine with each other, forming long chains. And uh, the type of the chain, the combination of, of the chain will, will be perceived by our uh, olfactory or taste buds uh, with uh, varying uh, different uh, uh, smells. Uh, chemists in Europe learned centuries ago that they could separate these, these uh, terpenes by distillation or also by dissolving the plant uh, in alcohol. And once the, sep the, the terpenes were isolated, they looked oily. You can put them in your finger and they're somewhat oily. And they call them essential oils because uh, in, in the beliefs of the early uh, chemists, uh, they capture the essence of a plant, the true deep nature of a plant. Now, it's an interesting thing. All plants in the, in the family Lamiaceae, to uh, a higher or lesser degree, contain essential oils. As a matter of fact, any good botanist in the field, uh, one of the ways of identifying a plant in the family Lamiaceae is just to crush the leaf in between your fingers and smell it. Uh, because if it does have uh, a nice smell of volatiles, uh, then you know it belongs in the family Lamiaceae. Also look at the stem. The stem is square and the leaves are opposite. It's a total immediate giveaway. But what is the nature of the role of essential oils? Why, why did this family develop uh, this, this very characteristic trait? Well, essential oils, terpenes, we can actually eat them uh, and they're not toxic to, to animals, to mammals, but they do impede terpenes, interfere with the metabolism of gut flora, what we call, or gut bacteria, what we call the microbiome, the complex community of microorganisms that lives in our gut. And it, especially uh, essential oils interfere with a ruminant flora of uh, the, the, the complex set of uh, bacteria, yeasts, and other microorganisms that live in the stomach of ruminants like cattle or like sheep. So basically what they will do is create a huge, if, if say uh, sheep or cattle eat only uh, plants from the family Lamiaceae, they will give them a huge indigestion because their digestive microorganisms, their, their, their microbiome in, the, in, their, in their stomach will cease to function. And they will start getting gases and vomiting and feeling uh, really uh, bad. So really, I have joked in previous years, but I think it's an interesting uh, trait and it shows how in evolution there is not one way to reach the same, uh, the same goal. When we saw the family Solanaceae, they're all toxic. And some of them are deadly toxic. They're, they will kill any animal that even attempts eating the leaves of a plant in the, in the tomato family. Um, and they have all sorts of different um, alkaloids that are extremely toxic to the animal that eats it. So there are, I always joke, so the Solanaceae are like the Lucretia Borgias of the, of the plant kingdom. They are assassins. Uh, but the Lamiaceae, on the other hand, they're like diplomats. Uh, they will not kill the animal that eats them, but if an animal eats too much of them, it, they will give them a huge indigestion and le gently lead them away from, from consuming too much. Uh, so, uh, most animals learn very quickly that uh, they might be even lured by the nice uh, smell of, uh, of uh, Lamiaceae, which by the way also lures pollinators to their flowers. They, they attract animals because the smell of the terpenes is so nice. 
but uh, most animals learn very quickly that they shouldn't eat too much of uh, of a plant in the mint family because it can be uh, it can give you an indigestion. Um, so that is a very interesting trait because by doing that they might attract herbivores but also lead them to eat neighboring plants that don't have terpenes. So like in 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 a very interesting diplomatic arrangement they might lead other animals they might lead animals to eat other plants around them uh, and hence to kill or at least to affect uh, their competitors and give them a very interesting um, competitive advantage within the the ecosystem anyway that's the story now let's talk a little bit about some california plants the whorehound very common throughout California. It's a weed. Uh, it's not really native. It's a European uh, in origin and it's all over our agricultural fields. Uh, you can see here the dense arrays of clusters of spikes on the on the nodes. Uh, the peppermint, Mentha piperita, very common in our ditches and waterways, very nice to eat and also used in drinks and things like uh, mojito or mint julep. Uh, it's, uh, it's really nice. One important plant is uh, the chia, Salvia columbaria. Uh, the chia has these dense clusters of uh, flowers in the internodes and then it dries. It's an annual. It forms a big part of the of, um, blooms in, in our uh, California chaparral and, and, uh, and scrub communities. And once it dries, these spikes they keep all the seed inside and they're very, very easy to, you can just pull the spike and, and, and grind it between your hands like, and, and, and it, will lead, it will yield a, a lot of seed. The seed and chia can be used for a number of things and uh, early Californian inhabitants used it as food. You can eat the seed in the form of cakes or tortillas and uh, you can also uh, boil them with water and they will release a mucilage that makes uh, the, the water nice and fresh and uh, sort of refreshing uh, to, to drink. Um, the black sage, Salvia mellifera, very common in chaparral. And of course, the huge the Salvia apiana, very common in, in wild areas, even in campus. We see it all over the place around campus in, in, uh, in, box, in the Box Spring uh, Reserve, uh, really nice. One, one anecdotal comment that I, I think is, is uh, very fun. Uh, when we eat chilies, we say that chilies are hot. And when we uh, drink or eat things with mint, like mint chocolates or, or, or uh, mint sweets, we say they're cool, they're, they're icy. Sometimes that's, that's uh, what many advertisements say, icy cool. Uh, the fact is that the terpenes in, uh, in the mint family, especially uh, in the mint itself, uh, tend to hit our, our taste buds, uh, the same taste buds that, that uh, detect temperature in food and that give the brain the feeling of temperature. While capsaicin, uh, the alkaloid in chilies, uh, hits, uh, hits the taste buds that detect uh, high temperature, that detect uh, heat and food and prevents us from eating things that are too hot. And, uh, and, and so it, it gives you eat uh, things that have a lot of chili, it gives you more or less the same sensation and the same reaction as a matter of fact that the drinking things that are too hot might give you like rubefaction, the red face, a sweaty face, a red nose, and uh, also a runny nose. Um, Okay, well, uh, the last, uh, Lamiaceus trichostema lanatum, very common in oak woodland all along our mountains around uh, uh, Riverside and in Southern California. Finally, almost done, the snapdragon family. The snapdragon family is tulipped, like the mint family. It doesn't have square stems. You can easily identify it by what it doesn't have. It doesn't have square stems. The fruit is a capsule. It doesn't have the four nutlets of the, of the mint, and it will never, never, ever uh, have the smell of, of, uh, of terpenes, of, uh, of uh, the, the nice uh, uh, smell of, of plants in the mint family. It's not aromatic. Plants in the Scrofulariaceae 
are non-aromatic. Here you have a Scrofularia californica, of the California bee plant. The flowers are very small, but you can see here again the, the two lips, three, three below, two above, uh, and uh, it has the two above form like a banner, the three below form like a landing strip, and you can see the anthers and the stigma coming out of the flower from the landing strip. Uh, you can see here in the, in the snapdragon itself, um, the, uh, a cross-section, a photo of, of a corolla. You can see uh, the, the, it has a, a forked stigma. You can see the anthers. And it has one of the anthers is aborted. It does, one of the stamens is aborted. It doesn't have a stamen. And we call it a staminodium. And when an insect gets in to uh, find the nectar here, and the nectar is at the bottom of a flower, it will brush and fright, uh, fight against the hairs of the staminodium. And in doing so, leave the pollen against the stigmas. And then on the way out, it will hit the anthers and take the pollen of this plant into the next plant. Some California plants. This one is beautiful. Very, very common in the Santa Rosa Plateau. Colincia heterophila belongs in this family. It's a pity we're not going to see it. It's a great opportunity for photographs. Um, known with the common name of Chinese houses. Don't ask me what is the origin of that common name. I don't have a clue. But that's a, the way that uh, ranchers and cowboys will, will identify it. Really nice. Uh, you can see here the two petals on top, the lower lip, and here the area with a white color with a, a reddish spots that attract the insect to the center of the plant. Uh, the chaparral beard tongue, Kikelia, uh, very, very important and very common in California, the uh, monkey flowers of the genus Mimulus. Mimulus arantakios, the bush monkey flower or the the golden mountain monkey flower, very common in the Santa Rosa Plateau, would have seen it. Uh, and in uh, along rivers, um, the waterways, Mimulus guttatus, the yellow monkey flower, also very common in Southern California. And of course, the one that gives the family the name, Scrofularia californica, gives the Scrofulariaceae uh, their name. Uh, oh, sorry, um, the bee plant. It's very small. Uh, you can see here the two petals on top, the lower lip below, and the sexual parts emerging. Ah, and two more, the, pens the pensamons. Pensamons are one of California's gifts to gardens in the world. They're beautiful garden plants. They're annuals. Uh, they grow in chaparral. Uh, and there are a number of species of pensamon. The most common ones in Southern California is the showy pensamon which is this purple, violetish color, Pensamon spectabilis, the showy Pensamon, and Pensamon centrantifolius, known as the scarlet bugler, uh, which is, we would have seen it in Swarthard Canyon. It's all over the place there. It's a beautiful plant in the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, San Jacinto Mountains, and the lower parts of the mountains, and all the mountain ranges that surround Riverside. So let me stop sharing here. Uh, this is uh, the end of the five-parted uh, families. Let me try and recap what I think you should learn. Uh, unfortunately, we're dealing with uh, these difficult times. We're not going to be able to go to, to the field to see these plants. They're really beautiful. And it, 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 it's, it's really a great spectacle to go out to the field and see them. Uh, but uh, you can check on them online. And also I made an effort to talk about uses, talk about essential oils in the Lamiaceae and the uses we give them, which is, of course, I talked very superficially. You can explore much more about that for your exercises or for um, um, essays in the future. Uh, midterm exam or whatever, and also, of course, the Solanaceae, the, the, the applied part, the, the, the economic botany, as we call them, the uses of the Solanaceae are extremely, extremely 
in Bodh and they, and they have a huge bearing for human beings. So this is the end of this uh, lecture. Again, lecture two, week four. And uh, next uh, Friday, which is going to be April the 24th, we are going to see um, the three-parted families, um, especially the Liliaceae, the Lily family, which is a monocot. But I leave that for next Friday, and uh, I wish you a great day. Thank you very, very much.